Okay. We're getting ready to start here in a few minutes. So we're coming to, to you from beautiful downtown Colwich again, the Flatland Fly Fisher Studio. We are, uh, want to thank the city of Colwich for letting us use the building. Uh, got a nice facility here and those people have just bent over backwards to help us all they can. So uh, we're going to, seven o'clock's coming up here in a few seconds, so we'll, we'll get started here in just a minute. If you have any questions, just make a comment down there. Ryan's with me tonight, and we're both going to tie flies. Uh, so if you have a question, just chirp in or just make a comment. One of the two of us will be watching the comments uh, throughout the broadcast tonight. So uh, that way, if you have a question about something, uh, we'll just jump right in and ask the question while, while, I'm, while we're tying. So uh, that's just the way it works. Uh, we've got some new equipment tonight. We've got a new microphone system, so hopefully the sound is better than it has been recently. So uh, it's, it's, we're, we're just, it's, it's always a test with us how, how things are going to work. So um, we've got some new equipment tonight. Hopefully it all works well and we have a good, we have a good broadcast. Sheldon saying the volume seems a little weak. Of course, what we did was we put the mic by where you're going to be, and then you backed up. Yeah. So, <laughs> how about now, Sheldon? Is, is the microphone better? Can you hear me better now? And when I move in close to my vice here in just a few moments, it, I'll move the microphone. So, uh, I tell you, what's going to happen tonight is I'm going to tie a fly. Uh, I'm going to tie a woolly bugger. We're going to work on uh, some things with the woolly bugger. I know everybody ties one. And we're going to tie. I'm going to tie my version of the woolly bugger, which I know is different than what you may tie. And but, it, <coughs> but it's a it's a great pattern. And then when I get done, we're going to have a little technical difficulty, and we're going to move the camera over to Ryan's vice, and then we're uh, we'll get started. And Ryan's going to tie. A slump buster for you tonight. So we've got two good warm water patterns that catch fish. So we're about ready to start. <laughs> it's something about voices with that mic because he said that didn't really change with you, but I'm loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just have to deal with it, boys and girls. So I I'm going to scoot up so you don't have to look at my face anymore. And we're going to get started. So, tonight we're going to tie a woolly bugger. Pretty straightforward pattern. Uh, Russell, a guy named Russell Blessing in Pennsylvania is the one who uh, is credited with originating this pattern back in the late 60s, early 70s, depending on what website you go to. Obviously, it's a it's a, <clears throat> a uh, variation of the woolly worm, which has been around forever. So uh, I think when so this fly, but it, it, this thing will catch. I've caught trout, bass, carp, catfish, bluegill, you name it. I've caught on there. Or yellow perch. So uh, uh, never caught a pike on one, but I've never fished up for a pike with one this size. And you can do about anything you want. This is the probably the wildest woolly bugger I have. This and it's tied with a pine squirrel, but it's got the bugger on the bottom. So you can use about anything you want for a tail. You can even tie them on a jig. I like fishing this under an indicator when I want a bugger under an indicator, and I can just tie this on a jig and uh, just fish it the same way, except I don't strip it. So let's get started here. I am in my vise. I have a 1 8 tungsten bead on a streamer hook size 10, 4x long. So I think that makes for a good bugger length. So we're going to start our thread right behind our right behind our bead. I'm going to take about five wraps forward, and then I'm going to do five wraps back. Five. Then I can come in here and. 
nip off my thread. Yeah. So the way I, that I like tying my bugger, and I tie with 140 denier uh, UTC thread for most all of my flies, and I like to to spin it counterclockwise and get get the thre thread flat. That way it covers my hook. Now I'm going to make I'm going to cover my hook all the way down to the bend of the hook, about even with the barb. Then I'm going to go back, touching turns again, with fairly decent thread pressure, not too tight, not too loose. And what this does for me, it gives me a really good foundation to tie my fly on. The shank of the hook is slick, and I want my materials to grip and, and be where they want them. So I've, the first thing I want to do is make sure that I've got a a nice, a nice even body, no lumps or bumps. So flattening your thread will help with that. So come up about an eye length behind my bead. I'm going to stop. First material I'm going to use, I'm going to use just a, a marabou strung feather, not the bugger feather. I like these, I like these feathers better because they're webbier for a tail. Now, building a quality fly, you want to do things in such a manner that you make a, a good sturdy fly that's going to last more than one fish. So things you have to be concerned with are proportions and bulk. You don't want your proportions to be out of, out of sync with each other. and the measuring stick that you have here is from behind the bead to the bend of the hook on the shank. So you don't want your tail to be any longer than the shank of your hook, which would be, in this case, since I have a bead here, from the back of the bead to the bend where my thread stops. So, and if you really want to get real technical about it, you can get out your ruler and measure that. And that's about eight tenths from the eight tenths, seven tenths. So in having that measurement. So first thing I like to do is lay my marabou on top and get a length. So if I'm happy with that, see how I have a pinch between my thumb and forefinger, then I'm just going to do the opposite. And I'm going to take my scissors and I'm just going to trim that off. Get rid of all that bulk. I don't need it. Then I'm going to lay that pinch right on top of my hook, right up behind my bead. Take one, I know you can't see that very well, one loose wrap, one tight wrap. Then I can slide my fingers back a little bit so you can see here. And I'm going to wrap forward. And as I do that touching turns, notice how all the fuzzies go away. Flatten my thread a little bit there, give it a counterclockwise spin. So now I've got my feather right on top of my hook shank. I'll slide my fingers back, just slightly moisten that. Now I'm going to do touching turns going back down the hook shank. Here again, there's no time limit on flood tying flies, so take your time, go slow. If you make a mistake, stop and unwind it. And the more you the more you wrap away from yourself more twisted your thread gets so you have to stop every now and then and let your thread spin out so when I get in line with the barb of my hook then I can let go and I have a nice short tail <coughs> I like a shorter tail on my buggers instead of a long tail that's the same length as the body so I want that proportion to be a little bit shorter so I don't have uh, short hits, short strikes, where they just grab the tail and they don't get the hook. So, if you pull tight right there, you get a little bit of flare. Now I'm going to run my thread back up to right behind the bead. <clears throat> and here again, 
Nice, smooth body. No lumps and no bumps. You have a question? Yeah. So is that a bent eye hook so that it will ride up? No, it's a down eye hook. Okay. So there's straight eye, up eye, and down eye. This is a down eye hook. Um, yeah, it will. I think Doug did some field work where he did some underwater video and buggers will roll with a down eye, will roll over and fish hook point up sometimes. But overall, with just a bead on it, you're not really, you don't have as much control as you right. could if you did some other things, you're correct? Right, right, right. So straight eye, down eye, it's, it, it's up to you. Here's the good thing about fly tying. Once you start your thread and once you do the, the finish knot at the end, everything else in the middle is all up to you. This is the way I do it. So, you know, do you have to do it this way? Well, of course not. So next thing I'm going to do is take my hackle feather. And here I'm not using a big webby hackle feather. I'm using the dry fly hackle. This is probably about a size uh, 14. I didn't bring my gauge with me. But the barbules on this feather are not very big. And I like it that way. I don't like the big webby feathers, but that's me because this is going to move a little more water, be a little more noisier when I strip it to the end. So here I'm going to put the, that concave side down. Here again, I'm going to do touching turns as close as I can get them. All the way back. Here again, just take your time. Notice there's no fuzzies. All those barbules are getting pinned down because they're all facing rearward. Here again, I'm going to just keep going until I get right there at the bend of my hook. Then I'm just going to run my thread back up to the front. Now, if you notice here, my body is still all the same diameter. It's getting bigger because I'm adding bulk. I've got two layers of thread, plus now I have two more layers of thread plus a feather uh, in there. So, but right here behind my bead, you'll notice that it's a little bit less thread and a little less bulk. That's on purpose because that's where everything is going to tie in right here at the end. So now I've got my feather on. I can just put that in my material clip, keep that out of my way. Then I'm going to use chenille. Obviously we're tying olive and I use micro chenille for my buggers. Here again, this is to cut down on bulk. I want skinny buggers. I don't want big fat buggers. Can you tie it that way? Sure. You want to use the largest chenille there is? Fine. You want to use sparkle chenille? Fine. Or you don't want to use chenille at all. You could tie a bugger with peacock earl, Ryan. Or you could do a dubbing body. Or you can do any number of things. You don't have to use marabou for the tail. You could use uh, calf tail. You could use deer hair. You know, any number of things. Here again, I'm going to hold that right behind the bead. Take one loose turn. And I'm gonna go pretty close to not quite touching turns. Notice how I've got, a, got my material kind of up at an angle a little bit. So as I come down, I'm keeping that right on top of the hook chain. This thread torque will pull it away. Now I'm gonna wrap back up, not necessarily touching turns, but pretty close to it. Okay, so now We've got all our materials tied in, and I want you to notice the body. No lumps, no bumps. Nice and smooth, because that foundation we put in was nice and smooth, so when we wrap all this forward, we won't have a lumpy, bumpy body. If we have a lumpy, bumpy foundation, then our fly is gonna look that. It will translate out to the end of the, to the surface of the fly. So are you saying that, <clears throat> like when I tie my lumpy, bumpy flies, that I won't catch fish? No, I'm not saying that at all, Ryan. Your lumpy, bumpy flies will catch fish. But when you go to the fly store, and when you're out in Colorado and you say, oh, they're biting on such and such a fly, and you go to the fly bin to buy a fly, and you look at it and you say, well, this is poorly tied. It's all lumpy, bumpy. It's not very nice. Would you pay money for a, a junky fly? No. I, I have been known to pay money for a junkie fly because I didn't have one so in my box and trying, I needed it. <laughs> well, the point here I'm trying to make is if you're going to tie a fly, tie a quality fly. Take your time here, medium pressure, and just run that up. 
nice even turns just palmer that chenille right on and if you tie as many buggers as i have over the past 15 years you get pretty good at guessing the length of your material now this is going to finish with my material right where i want it at the bottom so i'm going to come in with one turn behind I like, I like putting three turns behind my material and then three turns in front and that's really going to lock that, lock that chenille on there. Now, if you notice, I have my chenille and my thread are on the same side. Don't do that. I mean, it's fine to do it, but turn it up, turn your vise upside down. That's really nice about a rotary vise. Now my thread's hanging down, my excess material's on top, so when I go in there to trim it, I run no risk of cutting my thread. Okay, so just trim that off, trim that off. That's all the waste material I have right there. Turn my vise back over, maybe put one or two wraps right there. Don't, don't put 37 right there because you'll build up bulk. So now I'm going to take my feather, and you see that I have these little grooves. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but there's little grooves right there that every wrap of chenille made a groove. So I'm going to put my first one right in that groove. Now, here's 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 a another another point. I could put a feather in every groove, which is going to make that body really thick feather wise or I could go every other one so this is kind of up to you I like going about every other turn there so I don't build up a lot of a lot of uh, bulk in the thread just take your time come forward try and come across and when you come around when you when you go over the top try and be 90 degrees to your hook shank makes for a nice quality fly. It looks right. The spacing in there is a little bit of spacing in between each turn of thread. And are they all the same? Are they uniform? No, but that's okay. Because what is a woolly bugger? Good question. Is it a Helgemite? Is it a Dobson fly? That's what Russell Blessing said it was for. Uh, does it imitate a minnow? A crawdad, some other aquatic insect. Don't know. I think the fish don't know what it is either. And they say, hey, look, I don't know what that is. Let's go kill it and get it out of the gene pool. Okay, so now I'm holding my, my feather up. Take my th three wraps behind. Notice I'm not throwing this over the top. I'm just kind of hanging it. Now I'm going to take some wraps in the front. One, two, three. Some people like to break their feather off. I like to reach in with my scissors and just flip that off. And that's enough. I have enough length on this one particular hackle feather. I could probably tie another fly with that. Okay. So... Maybe one extra security wrap right there behind the bead. And see now we've, we've, I don't know how well you can see this on camera, but we've uh, got not a whole lot of bulk here. We're about the same diameter, maybe just a little bit less than the diameter of our bead. So now I'm gonna put the whip finish on it. Three turn whip finish, one, two, three. Now you could put a little glue here if you wanted. I don't like doing that for the obvious reason. I just don't like using glue to, if I don't have to. I use a lot of glue. But I just do a double three turn whip finish. One, two, three, and we're done. Now I can reach in with my scissors. I have this neat little tool here. I got it at uh, the Dollar General for a buck. Cuts my thread really nice and clean. 
Then I can take my small scissors, as you can see, I have some, some trap hairs there, some of those barbules. Go in and just clip those off close. Don't have to be too picky about that. Um, the fish will like this fly. So, and, and if you notice the finished product, that my hackle comes right to my hook point and it's all nice and cylindrical. I, you know, if you take it to fly out a device and look at it this way, you get this nice round, round effect here. Now, Sheldon, and I've already answered this to a degree, but while you were wrapping your hackle, he asked, so if one made a mistake wrapping, can you unwrap and start over? Yes. I mean, most definitely you can always stop and unwrap your whole feather. As long as you've not tied it in, you, you're golden. You can go back and fix whatever mistake you see. Yeah, what I told him, like, if you if it's just as you're wrapping the feather, you know, main thing is, on, on any of the materials, I mean, you could even, um, you could have unwrapped the feather and even undid the chenille. Of course, once you cut that chenille, you don't, trying to redo it, you're kind of in trouble there once you cut a material. But making sure when you're unwrapping to still keep pressure on that material because it will, if you if you started it unwrapping that feather and quickly lose it'll pressure. It'll blow up on you. So. Yeah, it'll go poof. Just like thread tension, material pressure, right. especially when you're wrapping things is important. So this is the way I like to tie my bugger. Could I have made it thicker, thinner? Yeah, could I just wrap the thread in the hackle and not use the chenille? Sure, that makes a really skinny bugger. Could I use a bigger, fatter chenille? Sure, it makes a bigger, fatter bugger. Depends on what you want. Can you tie this on a size two odd hook? Why, certainly. Can you use a cone head? Yes. Can you use bead chain eyes? Yes. Can you use dumbbell eyes? Yes. So, you know, it, it's all up to you. So it's, you know, make it your pattern. Could you put sparkle in the tail, wrap copper wire around to help hold that uh, hackle in place and make it a little more durable? Sure. When I wrapped up my chenille first, could I put a, I could have put a little uh, super glue along the top of my fly and wrap that chenille with super glue underneath it. And that makes it a little bit more durable. So there's any number of little things, but with this basic thing here, you've got a good cylindrical body, no lumps, no bumps, got a good foundation. This is a tough little fly. And as long as you don't break it off or a fish take it away from you, you can catch who knows how many fish before you wear this thing out. So, uh, any more questions? I haven't seen any more questions. I did just assign Dan with note taking the rest of the tying since he just showed up and was late. Okay. All right. So, uh, we're going to get up from the chair. We're going to move the uh, camera. So, bear with us. And we're going to start Ryan tie a pattern here for you. on camera. We have applause from Sheldon. Yay, and, and uh, Stephen said uh, you tied a great looking fly. I see that, thank you Stephen, appreciate it. And the comments stay up on the phone, so it's almost easier to some kind of watch them up there than yeah. it is yeah. on the iPad. Okay, we got, you. we got you here on, uh, I think we're in good shape. Okay, so as we've already talked about, I'm gonna tie what I call a modified slump buster to John Barr pattern. Um, his is just tied with a cone head. And the one I'm going to do tonight actually uses some dumbbell eyes. So kind of like Rick just said with the woolly bugger with the hooks, 
I fluctuate my hook on this pattern. Um, you know, I do like tying them on more of your streamer hooks, your 2X, 3X long, you know, even 4X long hooks. DJ just said, here comes the lumpy, bumpy fly. You're exactly <laughs> right. I, you know, I sit here and I watched Rick tie, and to be honest, we have tied at a lot of different things together, but it's the first time I have ever sat and watched him tie a fly from start to finish. And um, I tie to get flies to go fish where Rick makes sure they look really nice. So um, I can tie nice looking flies, but I gotta admit, that's not necessarily my focus a lot of times. <laughs> so yeah, this will be a lumpy bumpy fly. So, okay, so I got, I think I'm tying on a 52, 62 size eight tonight, I think is what I pulled out. Like I said, I, I hook size doesn't matter. Get a size that you like for whichever species you're gonna fish for. So So you can tie this on a size 10? Yes. Or a size two, two up? Exactly. And, and for all of you that were on from the very beginning, you know, Rick, he went through all the specifics on this, you know, measuring and all that. So I am not going to talk about any of that kind of stuff. I'm just going to tie my fly and, and kind of show you what it looks like. So anyway, so I got my thread started. I will go ahead and cover my hook shank. And, and I won't worry about making all the perfect smooth body like Rick does. Well, it must be my voice. Sheldon says sound quality reversed now. Reverse. So, so it's like the mic's actually picking up the person farther away better. So anyways, okay, so I did a thread body. I'm using a decent sized dumbbell, so I'm gonna build a little bump right here, about an eye length back. So this is the part that I wish I could show a little bit better, but I'll do my best to not get my... So I'm gonna lay the dumbbell on I'm gonna take one wrap over one way and then do a little figure eight. So right there, it's on top. Now, with this on top, that is going to try making this fly right, make sure I don't lose that, that way, more like, most likely. To do that, you gotta do some different things with the material. So I actually want this to go ahead and ride point down. So I'm just gonna let this roll over so once it rolls over like that, you can do a couple more figure eights. And then the important wrap is going above these eyes and underneath the hook shank and then pull straight forward hard. So that's what will actually start locking those in. That wrap right there and one of the things I used to do wrong is I would pull more sideways. If you pull more straight out, at least what I found, that really helps locking those eyes in. So I can put some more figure eights in there. And then again, above the eyes, underneath the hook shank. Just three or four, pull. So now my eyes are locked in. This is a good time to go ahead and put like some Super glue right in there. I'm using a little UV only because I'm trying some different UVs right now. So, and this is getting pretty old. Old enough that this bottle doesn't want to come out tonight, which is fine. I was using a different one at home. Yes. Hand me the mic. I can set it down here basically. And I can speak up. So I am going to. Sorry, I had to stop and think for a minute since we're talking about. I distracted him, boys distracted and girls. Him. All right, so. Ryan does not do well multitasking. No. And not tying and talking at the same time. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to use some. Switch bags. I had the other bag earlier. <laughs> I'll ignore it, but yeah. I'm going to use some pine squirrel, the main, main material on this fly. And the way John Barr does it, you actually put the pine squirrel in um, a little later and use the wire to hold it down completely. But I have a hard time getting it started that way. So I like my tail to be about 
the length of the shank, so I'm going to take that and then kind of make a little gap in it. And you will pinch the fine squirrel down a little bit, but it's not that big of a deal. So, a couple good wraps right there, and then I like to lift it up and put a wrap or two in front. And that's just getting my pine squirrel in there. You can use your material clip or just stay back pretty good. Then I'm gonna use a little bit of brassy wire tonight. I'm just using green, but I will fluctuate this color. So I'm just gonna lay this right along, tying on the opposite side, but I'm gonna lay it right along the hook shank. Unlike Rick and everything being perfect, I'm just getting this on there for me. because this will help hold the pine squirrel down later on in the pattern. Lumpy bumpy tying here guys. So getting my thread back here. Now tonight I am actually going to do a dubbing loop. Um, the, the pattern actually calls out for a diamond pearl braid which makes it easier in what I tie a lot of them with in different colors. Um, the black a lot of times you use a blue in the background or a blue diamond braid. Um, but anyways I wanted to show something a little different because that's the fun thing about tying. So I am going to do a dubbing loop. So I'm making my loop, making a couple wraps, going around my dubbing loop. A couple more black wraps. Now I'm going to take my thread up to the front. I'm going to do a little half hitch right here because I am going to use the rotary feature, which you can see I was tying something different last night. So I'm using some ice dub peacock. <coughs> So do you only tie with peacock ice dub? Do you use other colors? I use a lot. Can you use other colors? You can definitely use any color you want. Um, I've been tying a lot of flies lately with tan ice dub that are similar to the woolly buggers. There's some articulated, articulated patterns. Um, again, you know, the diamond braid, the John Barr pattern, black a lot of times uses a blue body. I'm doing a green tonight. Um, so just mix and max, 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 max. match, <laughs> and play around. So all I'm doing is kind of, because I like lumpy, I'm just kind of making a mess with this dubbing. And then the nice thing about dubbing loops, open it up and I can just kind of slide that whole mess in there like that, which doesn't look like anything right now. Until I start spinning. And now I got a fairly tight, but hopefully that shows up pretty good. I mean, it's one thing looking at the camera's got a nice. So there's my body of this fly. Now I'm just going to take, use the rotary feature of my vise and start right back here. And I'm holding this tight towards me. And I can quickly wrap the body and then I'm going to get that out of the way come around my thread that's holding that dubbing loop just like what Rick did with some of the stuff and now I can just lift this up and cut that off so there's the underbody of this thing and then this this ice dub, what's so nice about this stuff is you can kind of, you can comb it out and make it a little more buggy if you want to. So then I'm going to take my pine squirrel. I'm going to lay it over the top. And behind these eyes, I'm going to open it up just a little bit to give me a tie-in spot. And I'm going to catch the pine squirrel. And all you need is about two, three wraps. And I'm not going to take this off yet because I'm still going to use this. 
Then you're going to take the wire, and this is why I said the actual pattern, John Barr will tie this body on right here. And then he'll actually lay this pine squirrel on and use this wire to hold it the entire length of the body. But I personally have a hard time getting the pine squirrel on top using the wire. So this is this wire is really just kind of holding this body in the middle. Right. Yes. We have a question here. Somebody's asked, can you show the tool for the dubbing loop? Sure. I got different ones but I will show the one I was using tonight. It's one that I didn't like actually until here recently. I've, I've kind of learned to start using it again. So I just run the wire through there. You can kind of tell that it's holding some of that pine squirrel down. You know, but one thing I really like about pine squirrel is if you see it in the water, it has a lot of movement to it. So what little bit I've held down there, you're not gonna see. So anyways, I got my wire, I caught it. Uh, with my thread a few wraps and then I'm just going to helicopter that up. So dubbing loop tool I was using tonight. Um, it's actually I think Rising, I think that's who sells it, it's the Kelly Gallup dubbing loop tool. So it's just got a little hook on the end and it's actually got a picker at the other end. And to be honest, the first times I used this, I did not like it, but I kind of learned to use it where you, you kind of let it sit here and you can spin it pretty easy there. But they make, you know, I was using one like this quite a bit. And this one, you make the loop and your thread will come in here and you can just spin it with your fingers. So they make a lot of, a lot of different ones. I would just find something, me personally, the ones that just got small knobs and stuff on them, it, I don't know, it's more fatigued on doing some of those. Um, like the first one, I didn't do dubbing loops for a long time because the tool I had, I thought made it a little bit harder. All right, so I'm gonna add some legs to this, which is not on the actual pattern either. So I'm gonna use some just little silly legs. And I'm just gonna put in about two legs on each side. So I'll cut two strands. And right here where I've got this little gap right now, I'm just gonna get my legs kind of in there. And again, I tie just to go fishing versus Rick who goes fishing and makes pretty flies. So all I did is I took that thread over the top of that just to kind of get it held in there. And then I'm holding, I'm doing the side clay closest to me to begin with, and I'm pulling, I'll show you kind of what I'm doing on, try doing it on that side. So I'm holding this, the rubber legs kind of down the side and trying to, hopefully you can see it, I can't even see what I'm doing right now, but I'm trying to catch it on the side of the body just to kind of get those legs going down the side, which I didn't get these tied in that evenly, but show and tell, right? So I got some rubber legs in there. I'm gonna pull this back, get my thread in front. One of the things I like about this fly is it does have a little collar. So with this pine squirrel right here, you're gonna kind of brush it back. Try not to catch my rubber legs too much and just do a couple wraps and you get a nice little collar right behind those eyes. And then I will come back up through that mess right there and I'm just trying not to catch my rubber legs on that side. Which that's where, you know, I just went and packed up some of these fancy little clips the other day. So you can use fancy little tools that you steal from your daughters to hold them out of the way like that. So I'm gonna cut off my pine squirrel and I'm gonna do a few more wraps right here. See that lumpy bumpy head? Rick, I can just see the angst on his face right now. 
So then I'm going to go back, and this is where I could create another, ah! another dubbing loop if I wanted to, but I figured tonight's a good night to kind of show, you know, options and show different ways of doing it. So I'm going to get just a little bit. Remember, I'm dubbing. One of the keys to dubbing to keep it sparse and add to it versus trying to add a whole bite. And once you kind of get it started, you can get it tighter on there too. So I'm just going to add to this a little bit. You can add more dubbing? You can add as much as you want. Really? So see, I'm, I'm getting a little low. I'm going to reach my bag. Get a little more, I mean, just a little bit. So the old adage, less is more. Yeah, especially at stuff like this ice dub. I mean, I that's one of the mistakes I definitely did to begin with a lot, was got too much dubbing on things, and I, I never could dub, and it was just because I was doing it wrong. So I just kind of dubbed around the eyes. I did a little figure eight, just to kind of try covering up those eyes. I'm going to do a few wraps right here in front. Get that all tied off. Drop my wet finish tool. Do a wet finish right in front of those eyes. And you know how Rick was showing that fancy tool he has, so if you hold your scissors and just leave them open, you can do the same thing with your scissors, too. Yeah, my fancy tool costs a whole dollar. Yep, I know. So I take my little rubber legs off, and I do like to take a fancy brush <laughs> and kind of just take that ice dub and make it a little rough. So, I mean, there's... I tie, you know, Rick showed a lot of very good techniques um, and detailed techniques with his. Um, I was just trying to show a pattern and honestly when I go to fish these, I, I go through quite a few of these. I, I give away a lot of these. Um, I see why. Yeah. Yep. So I tend to tie, tie them very quick. But like I was saying, so this one tonight, I did with... Um, some lead eyes, or actually they're just a dumbbell eyes, or actually a brass type of dumbbell eyes, with rubber legs. Here is same pattern, but with bead chain eyes. Um, I started off, and this is actually, so this one's using a little rabbit for the collar uh, with some green, but this actually has that pearl braid underneath this for the body. You can kind of see that in there. And the original pattern is the cone head. And basically this pattern, I mean, John Barr came up with this. It's, you know, was initially kind of a trout uh, pattern for rivers out in Colorado. And I started fishing it around here uh, with the cone head. And it worked, it worked, it worked really well. The problem was that I had with it was the fact that with that cone head, it sank quickly and I would get hung up quite a bit in rocks. So that's when I started thinking, okay, I really like this pattern. What can I do differently? And I initially went with just the bead chain eyes and that I fished this pattern a lot in, in different ponds and stuff around here. And the hook size, you know, this is a little bit bigger, smaller. I fluctuate that too because I do catch bluegill, crappie, bass, um, I've actually caught a large carp on one of these tied in a chartreuse. So it's a, it's a simple pattern, it's a quick tie. So is black your basic pattern that you tie most of them in? Or do you use purple or chartreuse or other colors of pine squirrel olive? Yep, you can, use, you can use any color. I will say that me personally, I fish the majority black and olive in our waters around here. I do tie a few. Um, I have fish chartreuse some, but I, I will say that 90% of my fishing with these is probably black or olive. 
And the black ones tend, you know, as you can see, like this one, if you can see it. Um, black, a lot of times they do a blue body, and with the olive, a lot of times they do some kind of a peacock green body. So tonight, I mean, I did so. Like, so another question I would have is that when you're, when you're fishing this, say, in still water, what size tippet are you going to use? Are you going to move up a tippet size or two with this? Or are you going to stay with 5X, 4X? So around here, I mean, I got my fancy furl leader that I made, and then um, I buy this high dollar mono line at the store, and I fish a lot of 8 pound, 10 pound, just mono line for my tippet. Um, so I, I so, tie it on hooks that are... So 2, 3X. Yes, it. definitely 2, 3X. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I'm using the same pound, uh, same spool of tippet that I bought at Cabela's or Ziner's or one of those places probably about five years ago for my summer tippet. Yeah. I just ran out of summer tippet. I just filled up my spool today. Yeah. And I have to go buy a new big spool, so... Any other questions? I think I covered what I yeah. wanted to. We have Michael Nichols just jumped in, so. You know, you guys, we're gonna try and do these fly tying uh, live things. Uh, we have some other tires so lined up, so it won't always be uh, the R&R &R show. We're gonna have some guest tires come into the studio here and so, uh, uh, and tie some, some patterns and, and um, uh, we've talked to four or five other club members who are willing to come and tie a fly for us. So uh, we're going to see a wide range of tires in this little series we're going to do over the summer. So. Got something to add, don't shut us down. So this pattern right here, um, Blue Go Fest, Saturday. Hope a lot of you guys that are on plan to come out. Hopefully the weather turns out to be perfect for us. Um, this is a pattern I fish a lot out there. I mean, the bait chain eye version is a lot of times what I'll throw um, up against the bank into the cattails. And then as the day goes on, you get more people and, and stuff like that. I don't know how many times to throw on this either in black or olive with the cone head and, and just drop it down in the middle of this pond and even in my float to basically troll and pick up fish. So some of this, what I'm tying tonight, there's a good chance I will actually be fishing this Saturday as one of the patterns I use at some point in time. So again, hope you, hope you can come out. Can we say start time? 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Maps on the website. I sent out an email today. If you have any, we'll questions. have we'll have the big club banner will be at the driveway, and just off of the driveway there. So if you drive east or west, you should be able to look on the south side of the road and see the banner. And when you come down to the drive, you're going to come to a Y. Just follow the flatland fly fisher signs with the arrows pointing you in the right direction. So we hope to see everybody out there. I think we've got like 17 people that have said they're coming. So it'd be a good crowd. Just remember, there's hardly any place to walk the bank. So there's no, there's very little, very little wade fishing. There's very, there's a lot of trees and brush around the lake. So if you do get down to the water, you're going to have a tough time casting. So bring your floaty device. Yeah, you can put you can put a boat on the lake as long as there's no gasoline engine. So, what are you doing now? You I'm just trimming my legs. Trim your legs up. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Now we're done with that pattern. We so go. we hope to see everybody. Now this year, due to the uh, uh, COVID thing, well, the, there'll be no lunch. So you need to bring plenty of water and hydrate, and bring a little snack. We'll probably fish till noon, one o'clock, whenever I'll get tired and the wind will blow hard if we don't get rained on. So I well, hope to see everybody this weekend. Ryan, you have anything else? I have nothing else, Rick. Okay. So any more comments or questions out there? Sheldon says thanks. Oh, oh, Stephen. Stephen says thanks to Sheldon. Why, why are they talking? Why are talking to us? <laughs> So if no more questions, I'm going to push the finish button and we're going to get off the air here 
And we'll see you guys next time. Just look for a Facebook post when, when we're going to do this live again. And maybe we'll tip off who's going to be there. Mikey. If, if anyone watching is oh. interested in tying a pattern and not someone that we've already approached or asked, reach out to us. Just email me back at the club email address, the Gmail account you get stuff from. And, you know, we're looking for anyone willing. And it doesn't matter if you've been doing it a while or new. I mean, this is just a learning thing for everyone. So, El Presidente has, yes. has made a comment here. He says, great show. Uh, oh, that was Steven. But uh, Neil said to bring money to the Bluefield Fest if you want a new club t-shirt. Yes, I have not put that in the email. Good, good point, Neil. We have, we have new club t-shirts. They're gray, great logo on the front, great logo on the back. But here we're going to be out, in the, out, on the, out on the lake, so we will not have our square with us. So bring cash. And I assume Neil is listening to my voice right now, and you will bring change to make change with Neil. So uh, I will try finding that price sheet again or make sure uh, a specific person gets it to me so I can send out specific prices. So if you can bring exact change, the better. Uh, so I will try getting that out tomorrow. I forgot about that, to be honest. We have more applause and a great show. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you. Um, we're going to sign off now. So unless somebody's got another well, quick question, we're going to push the end button. You got to give it that whole five seconds. Yeah. It can be tightened. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. I'm not seeing anything, Ryan. All right. Thank Good night. You guys.